Welcome to Longevity Industries' presentation of the Destiny of Manufacturing podcast. I'm your host, Dean Phillips. I'm glad to be here with you today, and I have an incredible guest on here today. Ah, yes, it is Josh Kramer, of course, from uh, America Makes, where he is the Director of Education and Workforce Development. Josh, how are you, sir? Uh, Dean, great. I'm fantastic. And, and thank you so much for having me today. Uh, it is an absolute pleasure. Uh, I've been blessed to have, have you as a friend and a mentor all these years. Oh, it's, been, uh, it's great to join you today. Oh, thank you so much. You're too kind, too kind, sir. Uh, full disclosure, Josh and I have known each other probably at least a decade almost, I guess. You know, oh, if not more. Uh, yeah. I, I think COVID always <laughs> adds some years to that one for sure. Yeah, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it's been, it's been fantastic. It certainly added gray to my hair and beard. I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. So Josh, I got to ask you right away. Are you related to Cosmo Kramer? <laughs> it, if only, right? I mean, you know, I, I always say, uh, you know, Kramer with a C. Uh, That's right. You know, for, for most folks, right? And, and so, depending on the situation and who you're talking to, they may or may not say I'm related. So, uh, very, very true. As you know, Dean, you've known me for a lot of years. We we like to laugh and have fun uh, and, and work and those kind of things. And when you're passionate about what you do uh, and you love what you do every day uh, and you surround yourself with great people, um, you know, it's, it's all having fun, uh, which, which multiplies the impact and, and it's best we can have together. I, I agree 110%. It's, it's an area that when it comes right down to it, if, if you're doing something you love, you, you know, the old saying, you know, you never work a day in your life. And I, I've, I believe in that because I enjoy what I do. I enjoy making a difference in people's lives in safety and also in, um, improving manufacturing and, that improves everybody's life. So. That's right. And I know you've been very uh, engaged with youth uh, over, over your career and, and mm-hmm. still are and those kind of things as well. And, and we certainly appreciate everything you do, not only for the industry, but the, the future talent that's coming up into that pipeline as well. Yeah. So right off the bat, who and what do you see changing over the next five years as far as technology, manufacturing? How are things going to be different from now on? Wow. I mean, you know, it, 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 it's a huge, it's a huge question. Right. Uh, and I think that when we look at this and, and again, I obviously oversee educational workforce development, that, that's where I've been uh, kind of my career, but I, I'm one of those kind of oddities that, that has both been on the technology side. Um, I'm a card carrying member to many industry recognized credentials and certifications worked with manufacturers for a long, uh, a long time over my span and career. Um, and then obviously on the education side, the workforce training side, those kind of things. And I think that when we look at specifically, what does the next five years look like? I mean, you know, we're up against, uh, you know, I'll, I'll call it a talent crisis in, in a way um, where we're not only, you know, as we've known it as the manufacturing skills gap, right? Which is not saying, hey, there are people, we just, you know, we got a mismatch of skills and and what I always felt and still to this day feel, which is, you know, an awareness gap, really. Folks don't know yes. what they don't know, um, which, which is a lot of that. But I think as we really try to grapple with that and then now in, in a situation in society where, you know, more than manufacturing is also seeing the crunch, right? You look at the, the, the trucking industry, you know, and, and finding folks to fill those roles is really difficult. Um, all the way down to your local businesses. If you're driving through small town America or you're driving through a city, everybody's hybrid, yes. um, you know, and, and there's lots of options. And so manufacturers are going to be continued to look at ways to automate processes to become more uh, efficient and competitive. I think, you know, we as a nation have a renewed sense of, you know, um, reshoring and, mm-hmm. and making stuff here in the United States and, and strengthening supply chain is something America makes is, is dedicated to. It's something we've been a big part of through, through the COVID crisis and, and really always have been working with small, medium manufacturers, but really have, has boiled up. As you know, additive can be a, you know, an excellent demonstration of agile manufacturing and yes. distributed manufacturing. And so, you know, we've, we've been a large part of that um, through a number of initiatives, like I said, demonstrated through the COVID crisis. Um, but really, you know, hoping that it's not something that kind of dies down and goes away, you know, like, 
everyone struggled when everyone struggled to find toilet paper, you know, it was a big problem in manufacturing. Right. And, but when you look at it, it's like, Hey, no one's having that problem now. So I mean, kind of not forgot about it, but like, doesn't think about it every day. Right. And so we want to make sure that we're in the same situation where folks aren't thinking about or not forgetting that, you know, there is that, that supply chain and ensuring it up. I mean, we still have an issue with automobiles and, and other, you know, again, my son is a, a race car driver, my daughter's a ballerina. I can tell you in both of those worlds that that there is there is a hard time getting point shoes for ballet. <laughs> and, and with my son and his racing of sprint cars and carts, we have a hard time finding race parts. Yeah. Um, so I think I think everyone sees those things, and I think manufacturers are looking for ways to to be agile uh, and those kind of things. And again, as America makes being the additive manufacturing institute. Um, we're definitely, you know, having, uh, our, our phones ringing, our emails, our inboxes are filling up because folks are looking to add it as, as a potential solution. So I think we're going to see more adoption of these advanced technologies. I just, uh, was at SMX, the smart manufacturing experience this week with SME up in Pittsburgh, you know, again, uh, uh, an event all focused around smart manufacturing, the adoption of that again, think efficiency, you know, think really using these technologies again in, in the, you know, fourth industrial revolution, yeah. uh, you know, it, it, we know we're immersed in. And so I, I see more and more of those types of things. Um, and I think the workforce landscape will dramatically change with the way that we not only present workforce training and, and build a, what we would call a talent stream, you know, uh, where folks can step in at any, any level, not just a pipeline of one in one out. Um, but looking at, you know, where we find those folks, how do we engage them, at their level, especially as a Gen Z audience. Um, but as we know, society is, is kind of changing a little bit. And then, like I said, the tools we use to engage that audience. And, and so, you know, we've been big across a couple of those things and we want to make sure that we're out in front, you know, kind of driving some of that conversation and, and helping to, you know, bring, you know, some of that to the forefront uh, around the technology as well. It's interesting. I really like what you said there as far as, the the way that we engage with them because i think that's one of the when we're, we're talking about our message out to students to the future workforce it's a challenge to be seen in the right light when it comes to manufacturing it's Ooh. and utilizing technology to make it more hey we are a state-of-the-art industry manufacturing is state-of-the-art and things like smart manufacturing will certainly engage that Gen Z, let's say, uh, students that are, that are coming out to say, wow, they are doing things with VR and AR. They are engaging using IoT. They're using uh, robots. They're using additive manufacturing. There's more things going on probably in manufacturing than most people even realize, and we I, I agree. We have a communication challenge of getting our message out to say, Hey, give us another look. Yeah. And, and I think, and I think there's, there's a couple of things that, that go into that, right? I mean, it's a complex thing. It's not just a mass marketing campaign, which is often what we hear, you know, putting a billboard up on the road, the same people see it every day. Um, and so we've embarked in a number of, of kind of focus initiatives to, to go and find the folks that just don't know. Uh, and, and so we get into that conversation of underrepresented groups. We get into conversation of, you know, um, just communities that don't have access typically to those kind of programs or to those kind of on ramps, you know, and, and we look at our strategy at America makes as a super highway, you know? And, and so when you, when you think about that and you think about, okay, well, where's the GPS that gets me to the highway and how do I on ramp and, then how do I pick what lane I'm in and which billboards are, you know, on the highway and those kind of things, you know, it really focuses into, we need to make sure that we're reaching all audiences. Um, one of the biggest things that folks hear me say all the time is, you know, we, in our strategy and our mission uh, at America makes an educational workforce development, we want to be there for every learner, how they learn, where they learn. And, and so that's, that it's a little different philosophy, right? It's not just engaging folks that are already in the pipeline. Yeah, we, we're checking that box too. Um, but we're literally making a concerted effort to go out and, and again, build that awareness piece and start with that. And so, 
it really gets into, and, and I've said this for a long time and, and Dean, you know, me, you know, I came from the education environment. I came as a classroom teacher years ago, what feels like a different lifetime. And, and I've had the blessed privilege to, to really see the light bulb turn on for a lot of students, which is the passion that drives me even to this day. And so, you know, for a lot of those kids, and a lot of those students of any age, you know, it, it's solving a problem that's bigger than them in, in a lot of these realms, right? And that's what manufacturers do every day. They're, they're, they're building something, they're creating something, they're making something that solves a human need or a want. And so when you boil it down to that, and, and these companies, you know, manufacturers, you know, they're not marketing, you know, they're not marketing machines. Right. And so many times you drive past the manufacturing company, you know, a lot of times there's not even a sign, <laughs> you know, so they're surely yeah. not talking about what they're doing behind their doors. And so a lot of times, and again, a student of any age, even, even as an adult, even as a parent, an aunt, uncle, grandma, grandpa, whatever it may be, you know, thinking back through solving a problem that's bigger than me, contributing to society and those kind of things. And I think that's one of those kind of carrots specifically in today's, you know, 2022, whether we, whether we say it's a Gen Z and it's a youth thing or whether we say it's just a societal difference in 2022, I think most folks, when we have the conversation about what manufacturers do and how they contribute and how it actually is improving the quality of life, um, for someone, mm -hmm. I think that's when we really inspire people to understand what manufacturers do, how they contribute and the work that they can be a part of, um, that really impacts kind of, you know, more the reason of why, why manufacturing, you know? Right. Um, and so we're embarking on a couple of key initiatives to focus in on that and make some resources and assets available, um, to really kind of hit that drum beat. We're going to do something called amjobs.org that's all focused around the people of additive too, because I think that's some of it, right? Folks want to look at, and again, this is students of any age, because you could be reskilling and coming from a, you know, cashier at Walmart. And we have some programs where we've done that literally. Um, we've taken a, we've reskilled folks that just didn't know this was even an opportunity to get into that kind of environment um, with a skill set that they have and where we can train up and, and reskill and upskill. Um, but I think when we look at, when we look at some of these and we highlight the people and what they're interested in, their passions, we'll find that almost everyone didn't decide to do what we're doing today in eighth grade career day. I can tell you, I did not, <laughs> you know, right. I have some weird zigzag path and you know, my history and those kind of things. And, and I mean, but it's like many folks in the industry have taken just these, you know, very non-traditional roads to get where they are and they're successful and they're excited and they're passionate every day. And we want to tell those stories so that folks can see themselves in those stories and know like, Hey, this is an opportunity for me too. Um, and so I think that's, that's a lot of it is we talk through those kind of things. Right. And I, I've, I've always felt in, in my background, when I started, I, I was, I went to a vocational high school. So I kind of had a pretty good idea of where I wanted to go, but it would not have taken me to where I am today but I needed that to get me to where I am today. It, Absolutely. it, it was what I rode my, I guess something that I attached and piggyback to, uh, learning in college, the electronics and things like that was not what got me to where I was today. It was the high school stuff of learning motor controls and things like that, mm -hmm. because the, the companies I work with in manufacturing, that's, it's a combination of both, but, understanding the motor controls, I could not have gotten to where I am without that. And I, I think that's sometimes overlooked with everything you learn has a benefit. I, I, there's, there's no such thing as, you know, bad education or things that aren't, uh, they, they frame and they mold who you are. Uh, and then it's really kind of things that catch your interest and things that opportunities you're presented with. And I, I think talking about, uh, to, to the Gen Z's, one of the things is, is that you may not even recognize sometimes when an opportunity presents itself to you. And I, I like the idea for, from an America makes standpoint of 
getting that uh, networking going too. Because I think, it, as you mentioned, I, I, <laughs> I like when you talk about the kids and say, you know, uh, maybe want to be a, a, a ballerina, you know. Well, you know, that's not necessarily going to be the career you're going to go down, but it might be something that it changes who you are. Because what it does do is think about things like additive manufacturing. Uh, a, a few years back when we've had some of the shows, one of the things we've had was a fashion show it, mm -hmm. it, where people were designing clothing uh, using additive manufacturing. And I think pe most people would never have even thought of that as an option. Yeah, and I think, and, and you're, you're hitting a great point, right, which is a lot of times one of the things that we talk about all the time, right, um, uniquely, and, and if I kind of unbolt additive from the conversation, because I think additive is one of those things, you know, when I was in a classroom in 2002 and we had bought our first 3D printer and we had bought, a, a you know, an industrial printer uh, at that time, and, you know, I used to tell students all the time, I'm like, the cool part is, is you as a generation, Will define this technology. It's not there yet. We haven't seen end state. Right. And I sit here in 2022, 20 <laughs> years later, and I think I think I can say the same thing. We haven't found end state yet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and we and when you look at some of the things that either other institutes, manufacturing USA institutes are doing, some of the research that's coming out of our institute with our companies and our partners and members. When you look at just where the industry is, and you're like, wow, you know, like I, I say this to our team. I'll, who thinks of this stuff, you know, but it's someone pushing the envelope to say, could we do that? Why, why can't we do that? And so there's, there's a generational shift that happens when, when we have a, a, a generation that, that asks that question, right. Mm -hmm. Kind of pushes that envelope. But I think that, I think that when we, when we challenge ourselves for those kind of things, we need to also think that manufacturers in general need all of those skill sets. A manufacturer just doesn't need someone who can be an engineer or can be a technician or can be a technologist. They need accountants. They need people in marketing and, and communications. They need, they need folks in, in legal. Um, you know, they need folks in customer service. And so that's all represented in a high school. <laughs> that's yeah. all represented in society. Um, and, and everyone has those skill sets. And, and so, I mean, we've even embarked into, you know, you know, you know, adjacent competency work. So we're looking at, you know, how do we, how do we then look specifically at unique skill sets? And, and so like you had mentioned, you know, all of these rich experiences, you know, I joke with my kids and I always talk about life skill summer, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so as they come out of school and, and you know me, Dean, you know me for a long time, you know, my kids are 11 and 13, you know, and I keep telling them, well, Hey, life skill summer, here we go, you know, <laughs> and we're going to teach us some life skills that you're going to need in life. And, and, but I mean, you know, we call those workplace competencies now, you know, we call those, you know, uh, job, you know, job competencies and those kind of things. And so, you know, you learn all of those things through all these rich experiences and, and, you know, there's famous sayings around, you know, the fact that knowledge is something that can never be taken away. Right. And, and so you, you use those as stepping stones to enrich where you're at and, and really fuel passions and those kind of things. And so even you talking about your story, you know, we're sitting here talking on a podcast today, something you're passionate about, right? So it's gotten you to a place where you're like, I can fulfill some passion and, and, and those kind of things, which is really cool because then you get to network to people that have like passions that, that align with yours. Right. And, and that's one of the really fulfilling things of the work that, that we do at American Makes, right, is, is finding all of those partners and aligning and, and doing great work and having great impact and those kind of things. But, yeah, I, I don't I don't want it to go unsaid that manufacturers need more than those technical knowledge and abilities, folks. You know, they do need those business capabilities um, right. of, of all of the folks. Um, and, and so, you know, that, that skills have got to exist just like it does anywhere else. Right. One of the areas that I changed my philosophy on quite considerably was when when STEM first came along, I I was a huge proponent of, of STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. I, I was a huge proponent for that. 
and then it be then they they wanted to evolve it into steam and and I was not a proponent of it at the beginning. I have to say that I was mm-hmm. not I was not an advocate for it. But one thing I learned pretty quickly and, and additive illustrated this to me was that adding the artistic side of things, adding that that component was they, that the people that came out of that area of discipline had a certain creativity and did not, and that where it lent itself very well into additive was you, you weren't bound by the same hard rules that you have in most areas of engineering. You could do things a little differently. Maybe I want this to do to spread out over this area. Well, you yeah. can't, and somebody would say, well, you can't make a, something that, that has arches outwards when you're printing. Well, then we came up with things, a way to do that. Well, we come up with supports and struts that support that part until it has solidified and, and cooled. Well, but the artistic side of people, well, they didn't see that at limitation. So when they're creating things, they could think beyond what limitations sometimes as an engineer, as a uh, somebody who works in hard and fast rules that, hey, when you're when we're stamping out parts, this is the way it has to be. This it really opened up my eyes to some new opportunities for people that otherwise would not have contributed. And I can remember being at a Boeing tour and talking to the people at Boeing and they were bringing in people from, and if you look at NASA did the same thing with people for origami. Well, that's how Mm -hmm. the satellites folded up was because they brought in people with outside skill sets to think about it. And they brought in people from different areas into Boeing when they were redesigning uh, some of their, their, their aerospace stuff. And they, you know, lightened up planes because they went to fiber optics. And it was, it's very enlightening when you take in people that have a different skill set than your people that you normally would look at. And, and I think when you talk about America makes and, and t- going out and presenting this to, to students and also to people who aren't even thinking about being students. There's there's people now that have graduated high school and say, well, this isn't for me. College isn't for me. And they can go and get a job anywhere you know, nowadays with the sh- workforce shortage. They, they could still go anywhere and still make a pretty good living doing just about anything. You know, if you show the aptitude and the desire, I think most people, geez, they are going to fast track you to whatever you want to do. But the, what's your passion? I think that's the key is mm-hmm. finding what are you passionate about? What do you love to do? What is it that you're not going to get up in the morning and say, well, here's another day, and if, if they tick me off, I'm just going to leave because I, I don't have any commitment to it because I'm not passionate about it, and, and there's no why. And you, you, you mentioned that earlier, and that's a word that uh, – you know, you hear a lot about that, that you have to present the why, not the what or how. It's the why that will kind of spur that imagination. It will spur that inspiration that takes them to another level. What was it for yeah, you when you got involved yeah, I mean, in that? And, and this comes back to a story that I often share when I was back in the classroom. You know, you know, I, had, I, had edu- I was an educator in the K-12, mm-hmm. you know, spectrum and I, at the time I was teaching a group of fifth graders, right? And and we would, you know, start the first day of school and I would say to them, you know, the one thing I want you to leave with at the end of this class, at the end of the year, is how to solve a problem. The kids would look at me, they feel like, is that it? <laughs> you know, <laughs> yep, that's it. You know, and I'm gonna teach you a toolbox along the way, but I just want you to be able to solve a problem and and we would we would do an you know an impossible task. We, you know, I'm going to give you a box of materials, and we're going to slingshot an egg into a wall, make it survive. You know, and and, and the reality was that they couldn't happen. You know, it right. was an impossible feat, but it was made to be that way because I wanted to teach them that the process was more than the product. Yes, and, and it was going through this process, and and failure happens, and how do you cope with that? And and you know, every year, and I had an awesome principal. Uh, who was a great mentor 
and um, you know, he would always know when we were doing this because the phone would ring off the hook in that office. And he'd, <laughs> and he'd come down with a big smile on his face. What are you doing down here now? He's like, I got four phone calls. Parents are upset. And he's like, you know, his kids come home upset because they, they massively failed this project. And I would say, Mr. Broglie, I said, you know, I said, I said, the process is more important. I said, so like these kids would fail and I would outline up all these contraptions and I would just roll a garbage can over and throw them away. <sighs> and these kids would be so upset, but it comes back to like, you know, where you were mentioning, you know, putting the blinders on and, and thinking that like, you know, constrained thought. And, and I always felt the younger you went, the more wild the ideas came out. Mm -hmm. because they had less constrained thought. They had less of the world telling them, well, you can't do that <laughs> or that's not possible. Right. Um, and so, but these students would learn like, Oh, wait a minute. Like this is all about learning and understanding, you know, how do I drive process and how do I, how do I innovate? And we used to end all the time with, and if I did this again, how would I do it different? And, and, you know, really trying to harpen that. And, and I can tell you with, with, just, and, and, and again, you know, me, I'm just blessed to have this opportunity where I still connect with a lot of these students. And I was just talking to a student of mine who is a you know, research scientist at Bayer here in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And she, to this day, just, she will just out of the blue text me something. Hey, remember this, you know? And, and, and I mean, it's just, my wife came home and she's a, an educator in that same community. And, and she was talking to a parent the one day and she's like, you know, Michael is where, where he is because of your husband's class, you know, hmm. and that kind of stuff. But it was, it was that kind of philosophy, um, you know, and, and it comes back to that creative side, you know, STEM education is, it, it, it's a teaching pedagogy, you know, and, and many folks did it wrong initially because they thought they could buy STEM, you know, and, and when I worked through a couple different roles and I was helping schools develop these programs, um, for me, you know, I would say to them, it's not something you go buy. You don't say, hey, we bought the STEM program. Now we have it, you know. It's a right. teaching pedagogy. It's how you approach these concepts. And, and and when they started with STEAM and then they started with STREAM and they put the R in there for research and then they did STREAM with two M's because then they would add medical. I'm like, all you're describing is education. Right. <laughs> it's all of it. And it all should be cross-disciplinary. And when a student doesn't understand that there is a clear delineation from the bell rang and I went to math class, and the bell rang and I went to science class and the bell rang and I went to, you know, pre-engineering or I went to tech or I went to tech ed or whatever that may be. When they don't understand that difference is when you're successful. And, mm -hmm. and we had students and, and, you know, there's a number of memories, but, you know, we had a, a sixth grade math teacher at the time who, you know, was just like, there's no way students can understand these algebraic concepts. They're just not ready for it. All this kind of stuff. I was like, stop down after lunch. Yeah. I said, because we're doing Alma's Law with a bunch of fifth graders, <laughs> you know. And, and they were like, no way. And, and I mean, this fifth grade math teacher, sixth grade math teacher came walking in and they walked up to the student. They're looking at their notebook, you know, these beautiful Alma's Law equations. And, and they looked at them and said, you're failing my math class. And, and I said, because learning's not real. It's not relevant. Right. You know, this, this student needed to figure out the resistance because we were building something that if, in order for that to work, they needed to know what value that resistance was. And so they had to work Ohm's law. They had to work that equation, which is an algebraic concept. Mm -hmm. And so, but there was very little transition to, they were learning math and they were learning science and they didn't know they were. Right. And, and so it, it's a really cool place to be. And, and, you know, so when you do that stuff, you can be, you can be pretty successful. And I think that when you talk through, you know, that career track, and those kind of things, you know, for many folks, it's not a matter of college versus career. And you see that and you see, you know, there's been some big strides and, you know, career signing day, just like there's a college signing day and a lot of great organizations I've been blessed to be a part of as well that do those kind of things. Right. But I think it's, it's all, isn't all of it going to career? Isn't it all about self wealth, which yep. is not just money, but it's maybe where you want to live, the things you want to have, maybe it's the trips and the journeys and the adventures you get to take. Maybe it's providing for your family, you know, it, whatever it may be. Maybe it's work-life balance. I mean, self-wealth is a lot of things, but it's all driving to a career. It just matters how you get there. 
Right. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's a big driver that we, you know, we try to drive with, with, with youth and adults as well, because like you said, a lot of these folks, they think, Oh, that was my shot. You know, I'm out of high school now, or, Oh, I, you know, I tried community college. It didn't work. Or I went to university and couldn't make, you know, into my sophomore year. And it's like, no, we don't want to lose you in the pathway. And, and we have programs that, that we've been pulled up all across the nation to, to try to make sure that folks know they can, they can come back and, and it's okay if you're a working mom with two kids, it's okay if you're, you know, a dad with another job or whatever that may be, you know, we have programs that we can deploy, um, you know, and, and that meet them where they learn, you know, kind of thing as well. Yeah. I, I think the other thing that's very helpful is if you can boil things down to a, a more basic principle, like you, you had mentioned it earlier and I, I agree with this completely because this is what I learned in high school was not electronics. I did. It wasn't that I didn't learn electronics. I, I did. And it's not that I didn't learn residential wiring. I didn't learn uh, refrigeration, but it all boils down to problem solving skills. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that that's one of the most transferable skill sets you can have if you know how to solve problems and it doesn't mean that, you know, one of the things I learned in engineering was it isn't about knowing everything because you never know everything. It's knowing where to find somebody that can help you get to that end goal. Who, who are your resources? If you're, if you have a skill set of finding people and surrounding yourself with people that can provide that solution that's incredibly useful. I, I think, you know, you think about it and I don't care, you know, political parties aside and everything else, it, you know, the number one thing a president needs to be able to do is his cabinet. Cause those are the people that surrounding yourself with are going to help you solve problems. And the same is true in business. Same is true in manufacturing is that mm -hmm. as an engineer, who are you going to call when you've got a, okay, you're, you took mechatronics. You're not going to know everything because you're not even at the point of where you had a four-year degree in, in mechanical engineering or a four-year degree in electrical engineering. You're smushing this down into a very condensed version of that. So how do we solve those problems? What, what areas do you feel like right now we can – focus on to say, look, you're, you just got finished. We, we want to grab you because you're one of the best of the best. How do we leverage that to show them here's where these skills are transferable? How do we go about that nowadays? Yeah. And, and, and I couldn't agree more with the, you know, the, exactly what you said. Right. And I think that's one of the really cool things that I think I've been fortunate to be a part of organizations over my career that do exactly that, right? Um, from from not only in a, in a classroom to working a project lead the way to working at SME uh, and, and just the network of members and companies and now what America makes and all of our partners and members and all those kind of things, right? Because you're working on that. It's all collaboration. It's all teamwork. Yep. Having those great teams that, that you're a part of and that you're, you know, critical to your success as well. Um, you know, one of the reasons that, one of the reasons that we've embarked in what we call micro learning is specifically on that same premise, right? Which is like, how do we teach some of these workplace skill sets? But then how do we then, you know, fight, you know, chop these really complicated things up into bite sized chunks? you know, 10 minute bite sized pieces, you know, it gets into how do we approach learners today that's different. Right. Um, and, and so we've embarked in a lot of that and, and it comes with that skill adjacency and those kind of things where we can tailor in the need of training. So instead of saying everyone has to go through a boot camp at the week or everyone has to go through the 15 week course or everyone has to go get the same four year degree, right. tailoring in whether it's a life skill, uh, acquired skill, uh, or is this, uh, you know, a knowledge that you've attained somewhere else or whatever that may be and tailoring that. But I think that to answer your question, when we look at, you know, some of these folks and, and where they're coming out and what do we tackle and, and how do we, you know, I think a lot of that, one of the, one of the reasons that we have kind of this multifaceted approach on talent 
and, and I always talk about us being focused on K to gray and people mm-hmm. say, what do you mean by that? <laughs> I mean, and, and I mean it sincerely, we're working as far down as K one too. Mm-hmm. And we're working all the way up to reskill upskill in, in industry. And we're working on department of defense training programs for the military, the DOD uh, environments and industrial base as well. Right. And so the reason for that is because we know historically, you know, we're, we're at an industry 4.0 in, in, in this environment. We have some companies that are progressive and have adopted, uh, you know, and, and have really changed. And we have some really cool success stories that America makes. We're you got a very traditional manufacturing company that now uses additive and it's huge success um, in that, uh, you know, kind of arena. But that change is going to get pushed from a couple of different places. It takes a unique leader to, to change from the top down, but it will also take the change from the bottom up, meaning just like it did when, when we went from drafting to CAD, right. <laughs> you know, it, it wasn't that a company said, well, Hey, on Monday, all of the drafting boards are gone and we're buying computers. Right. You know, that change happened because someone came in and said, you know, you could draw these on a computer and we can buy a plotter and we could just print them. And then when we make a change, we can just print another set. You know, um, it wasn't like we had to go back and redraw them, uh, right. you know, and, and that, and that change kind of happened because the bottom pushed up and, and the top kind of pushed down and or pushed back a little or whatever that may be. Um, and I, and I think some of that will, will move. And I think that as we look at, again, this generation coming up, I think you're, you, you will see, and, and I don't think it's just the Gen Z thing. You know, people ask all the time, ah, it's just the generation of, of kids today, quote unquote, right? I think there's a lot of qualities that Gen Z have that folks of my generation, uh, of other generations are starting. And I'm, I'm 39, right? Right. So I'm right on the bubble of millennial. Um, But that being said, I think there's a lot of generations that look at some of those qualities and think we actually agree with that. We like that thought. And and this societal difference, societal impact piece, I think is one that, Mm -hmm. that a lot of people latch on to. And I think, when we look at that, when we look at some of the changes, when we look at energy, when we look at, you know, we've talked a lot of folks around, you know, when you talk printing polymers, one of the first question is like, there's so much ocean plastic. Yeah. You know, why, why are we creating new polymers to print when we could be using recycled? You know, I mean, it's just, right. you're, you're starting to broach a lot of these questions that are bigger societal, you know, um, bigger kind of social impact or social responsibility. And I think that, for a lot of these folks, you know, solving problems, but doing so in the right way, um, you know, is, is where a lot of them will really push the envelope because it's, it's, yeah, we can do it that way, but if we do it this way, it also meets these three other objectives too. And I think that's where, you know, folks, and, and again, coming out of Gen Z, they're just, they're thinking more than just the answer to the problem. They're also thinking of how that, how that impacts their community, how that impacts other people. Um, and those kind of things. And, and it's a little different mindset, but I think that, you know, in, in society today, I think that's a lot of the drive is mm-hmm. how do we do this? How do we do it together? I think you see a strong collaboration drive on those kind of things. And, and, um, you know, I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be an exciting ride. I can tell you that. I, I think like you said, many people see it as, well, it's Gen Z, it's this. And I, I think that there's, you know, there's a lot of positives that the Gen Z uh, workforce presents. One of the thing is fearlessness. They, they really are a truly fearless uh, uh, generation. You know, they can look at something and say, I'm willing to go out there and risk it to do mm-hmm. that. They're, they really have that kind of, they definitely have a can-do attitude about things, you know. Yeah, there is, there is no doubt about that. Right. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of things and and I think we as a general society, right. Or, and and we're, we're building this, what we call the guide to 21st century talent, right. Which is how do we recruit? How do we onboard? How do we, how do we train? How do we retain? How do we build good culture in the 21st century? And, and so it's, it's kind of like this fun workshoppy handbook with a fact sheet of like your, your shorthand notes right? It's the clip notes guide to how do we work with talent today? And, mm-hmm. and we're, we're right in the midst of this project. And it's one of the things they say, you know, we, we want to do the somewhat impossible. We want to take the best from everyone at your company. We yeah. want to take that best piece 
right? And so if there's something we can, you know, we sat here and we said, how many generations were working at that company? Let's take the best piece of all of that. Right. Um, and, but I think when we look at today, and, and I think COVID has changed some of this in, in some facet, right? Regardless of age, um, which is, you know, it used to be, and my dad was a, was a judge in Pennsylvania, um, and, and he was probably of, an, of a generation that, that kind of lived to work almost. It was like, Hey, I, I worked my nine to five. I woke up every morning. I read the paper. I ate, ate, you know, drank my cup of coffee. I went to work. I went to lunch at noon. You know, I came home at four, you know, did the right. thing. He was at the coach and all that kind of stuff. So then he would go to coach in the evening, come home, eat dinner, take a bath, yeah. go to the next day, do the same exact thing. Right. Um, I, I would challenge today that many of us don't do that, right. you know, and, and it's, it's probably more of a, we, we work to live. Right. It's the opposite, which is everyone's working to do the things they really want to do or mm-hmm. they want or, or they, or they enjoy. And, and so I think when you marry those, as we've talked about here today, when you marry those is when you find success. And, and I think what more and more companies are starting to find ways. And, and I mean, I, again, I'm, I'm extremely fortunate to work at a company that does have this kind of workplace, even, you know, beyond our mission, right. Just being an employee, um, that does have that kind of philosophy and, and it is very progressive and those kind of things. But I think you're going to start seeing the companies who don't have an issue with talent um, or have less of an issue with talent are the ones that are kind of being in that open mind state of mind where it's really trying to understand that what does it mean that you don't work to live any, you know, you're not, you're not living to work, but you're working to live. Right, and it's a different mindset. And and I've worked with a couple of companies. I remember back in the education days, we worked a lot with with Luma and, and folks right there in Pittsburgh. And I remember at that time, you know, it was super fresh, where it was like, you know, they had this super rough model, and people just came and went, and there was no work hours, and there was you know bikes in the lobby and all that. You know, it was just yeah. it was a different thing that you didn't see as much. And you're seeing more and more of those, and I think you'll see more and more of these types of trends that again, I think just enrich these work environments and rich cultures uh, and all those kind of things, which again, I think is something the manufacturing industry could be a leader in and can really drive change um, rather than being behind it, get out in front of it. Uh, right. and, and, and then, and then I think we, we kind of, again, it's one less thing that's in the way, you know, from, from a manufacturing, you know, talent point of view. Great. Well, thank you so much, Josh, for being here today. We really appreciate it. It's uh, It's been great to have you here. Tell everybody how they can uh, reach you. Absolutely. And, and, Dean, it's been a pleasure. It's always a pleasure. Uh, yeah, so feel free to reach out. Um, again, uh, Josh Kramer, Director of Education and Workforce Development here at American Makes. You can see us at americamakes.us. Uh, you can also see me at josh.kramer, and that's Kramer with a C, at ncdmm.org. Great. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.